but uh, his, his name was Anthony DeMaria, uh, professor and chairman of the Department of Cardiology, University of Kentucky at the time, now chairman and department head, University of California, San Diego. He really launched uh, this concept. Uh, and what he observed, as I'll show you, <coughs> is that there were several deviation patterns of diastolic filling. He called them grade one diastolic dysfunction and grade two diastolic dysfunction, a more severe form of the first one. And what was uh, interesting to him was that, uh, and then of course there's normal patterns, and he collected a large number of patients, and then he, um, after five years, I think what he did was he went back five years back and found all these, uh, these echoes and, and, and just stacked them into normal diastolic filling pattern, grade one diastolic filling deficiency or defect, or dysfunction in grade two. And then he made a phone call to these people on which these tests had been done five years earlier. The first group with normal patterns, most of them answered the phone. Most of them were alive. And grade one diastolic defect, most of them answered the phone. And most of them were alive. But those with the type two diastolic dysfunction, most of them didn't answer the phone because most of them were dead. Five years. And what's peculiar about this <coughs> was that they really, <coughs> they didn't have uh, what we would normally consider to be significant heart disease by what we would normally measure it. Left ventricle could actually be okay. They don't have coronary disease. They haven't had a heart attack. So clearly what, what we're drawn to this was, you know, there's something important going on in the diastolic filling phase that in its most severe form, can be a worse diagnosis than cancer. I think the exact number was 75% were dead in five years with a grade two diastolic dysfunction pattern. Chronic, fortunately, chronic fatigue syndrome patients don't have that pattern. They're not even close, uh, but they do have with great frequency the type one pattern. The question then arises, well, are they just on some road of progression from type one to type two? Um, are they on some road, like many cardiomyopathics, such as myself, <coughs> were they on a road uh, to, to death or transplant, if not death? By the way, the statistics on um, left ventricular dysfunction uh, grade um, cardiomyopathy with dilatation is about a third will do pretty well, actually. They'll kind of, uh, they'll kind of do all right. They'll muddle way, their way through life. They are limited. They are significantly limited to even mildly limited very much like chronic fatigue syndrome patients are. <coughs> but they don't die. Uh, a, a third um, uh, will be severely dysfunctional, a lot of problems, and generally uh, degrade over time. And then a third go down rapidly. And either they get a transplant or, the, or they succumb to their illness. I was fortunate in, um <coughs> well, I was unfortunate in being on the curve that was I uh, was going to die and almost did, uh, but then was hospitalized acutely and, and they put a device in my chest called a left ventricular assist device, which actually took the burden of pumping off my heart and allowed me the time I needed to wait for a donor. And now I have a 20-year-old heart. And my life came back um, like it was, and amazingly. And I haven't suffered some of the complications that can accrue to heart transplant patients. But I learned a lot. I learned a lot about, about what happens to the human body when the heart slowly fails over several years, how the organs become disrupted, and how that expresses itself clinically. I got full instruction on that. More interestingly was how it comes back when you, when you get your cardiac output back. In fact, it, it comes back a lot faster than you lose it. And when things are coming back fast, you can see it better than when you're losing it slow over many years. I had that, that, that wonderful situation and seat where you can see this. And I was struck by how, as I recapitulated my organ system, one after, one after the other, how strange it was that some of the things coming back very much seemed like a recapitulation of this illness as you're going down, except I was coming back. It was a very important observation that I had. <coughs> And um, nevertheless, if you look at, if you read about cardiomyopathy in general, cardiomyopathy generally attacks a normal, healthy person in midlife. Actually, cardiomyopathy is a relatively young person's disease. It, it strikes children. 
It strikes women after they're pregnant, postpartum cardiomyopathy. It's not an old person's disease. You're struck in the, in the middle of your life when you're at your most vigorous. It usually follows, interestingly, a viral syndrome. Virus comes and you get hit, bam. And you, you've struggled with the virus, then it gets better, and then a few months later, you begin the long haul down with cardiomyopathy. That's how it begins. It's thought of as being a post-viral syndrome that evolves in the heart. A lot of very interesting um, relationships between uh, the start <coughs> of cardiomyopathy, and even uh, many of them, as I said before, stabilize after uh, several months, several years, and actually come back and are relatively functional, but always limited by their diminished cardiac output. It's not like heart attacks. It doesn't strike particularly one area of the heart. It tends to be a global phenomenon. There aren't particularly dead cells. The cells are not dead. The heart isn't dead. The cells just don't work right. There's something wrong within the cell that makes it not pump well for some reason. <coughs> and I'm going to explore with you today some of the reasons that we think um, might be going on to explain why this is happening. To really get at the, at the heart of this, therefore, I need to tell you what the difference is between, especially at the energetic level, between a ventricle which contracts and pumps blood out to give you output versus the what's going on at the energetic level for the cells to relax, indeed relax, and the left ventricle to actually uh, fill. Um, and so we'll, we'll play a game here. <coughs> which do you think takes more energy ATP energy, the squeezing of the heart or the relaxing of the heart? All those who think it takes more energy to squeeze, raise your hand. All the ones who think it takes more energy to relax, raise your hand. A lot of people don't know what's going on. <laughs> <coughs> uh, intuitively, I would think, you know, that squeezing, like lifting weights, takes more energy than just resting right? Not so in the heart. The great bulk of ATP generated in the heart is consumed by the act of relaxing. Very little is consumed by the act of contracting. And that's the key. That's the key to understanding this. A heart that lacks energy may have decent contraction, but damn it, it will not fill well. Because the filling occurs in two ways. First is called the early filling, where the, where the ventricle relaxes. The, the myofibrils are actually coming apart. The myocardial cell is elongated. And uh, what's going on at the cellular level in that regard is that eight calcium, which triggered the contraction in the first place, and is loaded into the cell, is being pumped out. Pumped out of the cell into the sarcolemma, these little tubular structures that hold the calcium outside the cytoplasm. The calcium is pumped virtually all out. It's like all out and nothing's in. The, <coughs> the analogy would be, would be to, I uh, visited a lake the other day and they had this, this dam and it runs uh, such that in the, in the daytime they let the when the, the higher energy requirements of the cities are highest, they let the water come down the chutes and turn the turbines. And then at night, when there's less energy needed, then they take the same energy produced and pump the water back up into the dam so that it's available to come through the chutes to turn the turbines again. Heart's very similar. <clears throat> when the calcium is being pumped out of the cell, that's equivalent to charging the system. It's equivalent to putting water in the dam. Sort of like... The and the water in this sense is calcium. It's putting calcium in the dam. And once, once the water is all behind the dam, which is calcium is all outside the cell, then all that's needed is a trigger, somebody to pull the switch, something that sets a, a switch off. And that's called the SA node that sends down the QRS complex, electrical signal, gating signal. It, it depolarizes the membrane, and the calcium rushes through, just like water comes down the dam and then begins to turn the turbine to create the energy. That calcium runs down a gradient, 
binds the troponin um, place and causes the it causes a deformation of a molecule and these fibrils then come together. Very little energy is expended. It's just a trigger. Another analogy would be someone lets go of a boulder, rolls down the mountain, crashes trees, crashes houses, crashes ho uh, cars, and so forth. And you look at that and you say, wow, that is a lot of energy. But you know what? It took a lot more energy to push the boulder up to the top of the mountain to get it ready to come down. Such is the case in diastolic function. Diastolic function, the energy is expended to create conditions which, when triggered, causes the contraction. That's it. That's the, that's the, the central fact of why you have this problem.